Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight, and welcome to Shepherd University. My name is Ashley Hurst. I'm the director of the Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communications here at Shepherd University. We are excited to welcome you tonight to, for a continuation of our American Conversation series. Tonight's panel discussion features a theme of overcoming division, strategies to stand united, and features three very esteemed individuals and a wonderful moderator. Our individuals tonight, and I'm going to just introduce them very briefly, and then uh, when Dr. Goldman introduces the discussion, he'll do more information about them. But we have syndicated Washington Post columnist and author of the best-selling book, Why Americans Hate Politics, E.J. Dion Jr. We have former, <laughs> thank you. We have former CEO of the Terrence Group and co-author of A Question of Respect, Bringing Us Together in a Deeply Divided Nation, Ed Goez. <laughs> and founder of the documentary film company, Decoded Story Lab, where he documents the realities, narratives, and perspectives that shape our world, Louis L. Reed. Before we get started, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank each of our partners and sponsors who have placed such a high value on fostering community dialogue. This conversation is part of the United We Stand Connecting Through Culture initiative that is being brought to you in partnership with the West Virginia Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. This program is also being sponsored by the Eastern West Virginia Community Foundation and Skinner Accident and Injury Lawyers, and we are grateful for their support. In the Subblefield Institute, we believe that when differing viewpoints are respected and considered in ways that avoid alienation, labeling, and silencing, it can further our nation's ability to solve problems. I am thankful and encouraged that you have chosen to join us tonight to examine the ways that we can overcome the division that seems to be taking hold in our country. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to Shepherd University's president, Dr. Mary J.C. Hendricks, who will formally welcome you to our beautiful campus. Dr. Hendricks, Shepherd University's 16th president and its first graduate to lead the school in its history. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Shepherd in pre-med and biology and her PhD from George Washington University in anatomical sciences. Subsequently, she was a National Institutes of Health postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard Medical School. Before coming to Shepherd, she was president and chief scientific officer of the Stanley Mann Children's Research Institute at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, where prior to that, she held various leadership positions at the University of Iowa, St. Louis University, and the University of Arizona. Dr. Hendricks has been a member of the National Institutes of Health Council of Councils, the National Human Genome Research Institute Council, and the National Cancer Institute Board of Scientific Advisors. She is a past president of the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, consisting of more than 130,000 members. This is the largest coalition of biomedical research societies in the United States. She has testified before Congress numerous times in hearings regarding the budgets of the National <coughs> Institutes of Health, Department of Defense, and National Science Foundation, and about human embryonic stem cell research. She also served as the co-founder and co-director of the Virtual Naval Hospital, a digital medical library created to provide critical information to service personnel deployed at remote sites, which was adopted by the navies of four countries. Dr. Hendricks became a leading scientist in cancer research with a goal of discovering new therapeutic strategies to inhibit metastasis. She has authored more than 280 publications on biomedical research and is the recipient of numerous awards. She has 16 patents related to the treatment of cancer, and these patents were recently licensed to a pharmaceutical company. Please welcome Dr. Mary Hendricks. Thank you. 
Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us at Shepherd University for overcoming division, strategies for standing united, an American Conversation Series event. This evening's dialogue is particularly timely as we enter what we'll likely call an exciting election year. <laughs> now, I would like to start by thanking Dr. Bill and Dr. Bonnie Stubblefield here in the front row. Thank you. Thank you. Without them, we would not have this extraordinary platform for this evening and for many, many other events. As we all know, the current political climate can be challenging and divisive. And it is important to have an open and honest conversation about how we can join together as a community to bridge these divides. Our panelists tonight bring a wealth of expertise on this topic, and we are very excited to hear their insights and perspectives. We anticipate this evening's discussion will be informative, thought-provoking, and inspire all of us to work together towards a more united future. Please know that tonight is not about all of us agreeing on any of the hot political issues of our time. Rather, it is about not letting those issues become more important than our collective spirit and our identity as Americans. Standing United is more than a political party or voting block uniting to defeat an opponent. It is about seeing each other as neighbors who deserve consideration and respect. It is about reaching out during times of need and not caring about political affiliation or anything else that makes us different from one another. In the spirit of being here at Shepherd University, where our mission is to train the next generation of leaders and model citizens, I encourage all of us tonight to be attentive students. Let us learn from our esteemed panelists, from the conversation that takes place, and from each other. After the discussion is over, let us take the spirit of learning and openness into our communities and inspire others to join us in standing united despite differences of opinion during this election year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. So I know everyone is not here to hear me speak, so I will be turning it over to our moderator, Dr. Samuel Goldman. He's joining us tonight from George Washington University, and I will let him introduce our panelists a little more. Dr. Goldman. Well, thank you, Ashley. Um, and thanks to Dr. Hendricks, to the Stubblefield Institute, and to Shepherd University for hosting this conversation. Um, once again, I would also like to thank you in the audience. Um, you know, it's customary at events like these to thank the audience at the end, but I sometimes wonder whether that's very meaningful because at that point you've already wasted 90 minutes of your time uh, and you can never get them back. I prefer to thank people at the beginning uh, when they still have the chance to escape uh, but decide <laughs> not to. Um, that said, I don't think you will want to escape because the members of the panel tonight uh, are knowledgeable not only about the political, moral, and cultural divides in American life, uh, but they also have experience in actually trying and perhaps occasionally succeeding in overcoming them. Uh, that goal is our topic tonight. In other words, we want to move beyond mere diagnosis of the problem and towards solutions, or if not solutions, then strategies that can help us to live together as fellow citizens despite our deep disagreements. 
Uh, to that end, I'm delighted to welcome once again uh, the members of the panel. And in the interest of time, I will not read uh, their very impressive resumes, which can be found on the Stubblefield Institute website, um, but I will point out where they are sitting in the panel uh, so you can be sure of who is speaking and whom to blame if you disagree. <laughs> uh, on my uh, extreme right, uh, spatially, if not politically, <laughs> Uh, is E.J. Dion, uh, who, uh, as uh, Ashley mentioned, is a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a university professor in the Foundations of Democracy and Culture program at Georgetown University. To his left, uh, once again spatially, but not politically, uh, is Ed Goes, uh, who is former president and CEO of the Terrence Group which is among the most respected and successful Republican sur re uh, survey research and strategy teams in American politics. Um, last but not least, uh, moving yet farther to the left, uh, is uh, uh, Louis L. Reed, uh, who is an award-winning author, documentary filmmaker, and advocate with a career of work on criminal justice, public health, and many other issues. Um, so, uh, as I've said, we want to move beyond mere diagnosis and toward treatment. Uh, but before doing that, I think it might be useful to try to get a handle on the dimensions of the problem. This is a big, pluralistic, and democratic society. And under those conditions, it's not very surprising that people hold different views. So why should we worry? about partisanship, division, and polarization. Um, or to put it slightly differently, when does disagreement become a problem? Um, and I will exercise my prerogative as moderator by asking EJ to start. Well, thank you for uh, turning to me first. I was hoping to crib off my <laughs> colleagues here. I, I also want to say it's great to be with you. And it, it, the president of this great university has spent her life on one topic, at least where I don't think we should be divided. She has tried to cure cancer and reduce its lethality. And maybe that can bring us uh, together. Um, so I think that we have had sort of, there are several reasons why we are so polarized. And there are lots of reasons. But there are a few that I think about a lot. Um, one is, the way in which our politics uh, now has become perhaps the primary part of our identity and that people's political allegiances now encompass almost every aspect of their life so that it has to do with religion, it has, with your views uh, of religion and whether you have faith or not, and whether you're a conservative or a liberal, a Christian or Jew or Muslim. It has to do with where you live. We are spatially dividing ourselves where we live more and more near people who agree with us and less and less uh, with uh, people who might disagree uh, with us in, in our neighborhood in, in Bethesda, Maryland is a very liberal and democratic neighborhood and I used to tell our kids uh, when we were driving around that even though we didn't vote the same way uh, they did, we should honor the people in our neighborhood who put up Republican signs because it took a lot of guts in our neighborhood uh, <laughs> to put up uh, you know, signs for Republicans but we don't even live uh, near uh, each other. All these identities are now bundled together in our politics in ways that I think make politics much more about, um, in a way, which sins we feel are primary. Um, and on one side are the, the sins have to do usually uh, with sins against faith or sins uh, related to sexuality, uh, people, pro-lifers, obviously believe that abortion is deeply wrong. On the other side, the sins are racism, sexism, homophobia, and we all feel very strongly about these, and we have good reason uh, uh, f to feel strongly about these, but politics is, it's, is a little easier when it is, say, about distribution or how to run the economy, where you can split differences uh, and compromise. And lastly, I think we have forgotten how to argue. Um, that we, argument is a good thing. I think everybody on this stage believes that argument 
um, is a good thing. Um, and Christopher Lash, the great historian, wrote many years ago an essay called The Lost Art of Argument, uh, where he argued that in real argument, you enter imaginatively into the ideas of your opponent, initially because you're trying to change her or his mind, uh, but in the process, uh, you put your own ideas at risk and are at least in principle by entering their frame willing to entertain what they think. And Lash had a great line to conclude this passage in a part of this essay where he said that um, you know, democracy is not always the most efficient form of government, but if you see argument as Lash does, it ought to be the most educational form of government. And I think now in our politics, we have much more competing assertions rather than genuine argument. Uh, uh, think of Bill Buckley's Firing Line show. That was a great show because Buckley was very sure of himself, as we all remember, uh, for those of us who remember Bill Buckley. And he therefore invited really, really smart people whom he spent an hour having real arguments uh, with. That is not what happens with argument now, so that funnily enough, I think in order to come together, we actually need to learn how to argue again. <laughs> Speaking of Buckley and firing line, um, those among you who can remember those broadcasts may notice that the way I hold my pen and lean back in my chair <laughs> is a tribute to Buckley, and if I lean back so far that I fall out, you'll know that I've gone too far <laughs> in my you, efforts. A point of Buckley privilege, it's one of, um, some of you may remember Mike Carrington, the great socialist writer, American socialist, who wrote a book called The Other America, which led uh, Presidents Kennedy and Johnson to rediscover poverty. It was Kennedy's trips here to West Virginia, and um, but Mike Harrington's book had a lot of influence. And Buckley debated, um, uh, was debating Harrington once, and the person introduced uh, Harrington as America's leading socialist. And Buckley, with that pen of his, leaned back and said, ah, America's leading socialist. That would be a bit like being the tallest building in Topeka, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, but I've always loved that. <laughs> um, it sounds like, uh, EJ, you're, you're suggesting gently that things have gotten worse than they used to be. Um, Ed, you've spent a career collecting and analyzing data about political opinion. Are we more divided than we once were? Uh, not only are we more divided, I think our country's in deep trouble um, on where we're at. Um, uh, you know, it's not just what's happening in politics. I mean, attitudes towards virtually every institution in this country is at an all-time low. It's not just government. It's education, it's health care, it's religion. You, you pick it, and it's at an all-time low. Um, and it's an all-time low because those institutions are not answering people's problems. Um, they're not listening to the people. They're trying to drive the people in terms of what's there. Um, you know, I spent, um, I worked my first campaign when I was 12, um, when I volunteered in a campaign uh, because my father was in Vietnam. In 1964, I volunteered in the Lyndon Johnson campaign. Um, and um, it just was a, it was a different time. It was about um, make America great again. <laughs> had an all different meaning. I mean, it was, it, it was make America greater, not great again. And, um, you know, I learned so much from my father. He um, saw the smoke from Pearl Harbor when he was 11, and all he ever wanted to do was go in the military. He went to Korea once, he went to Vietnam twice, he got bronze stars all three times, and he died of Agent Orange at 61. Um, but he taught me in that process a lot. And one of the things he taught me was to treat everyone with respect because they're an American. Um, I remember being on a ship on our way to Germany in 1959 when the news came in that Hawaii, his home state, had not even a state yet, was being made a state. 
and he had hidden a flag in, the, in his suitcase, and we sat as a family and sewed a star in the flag. Um, that's what I was brought up with, and I think that's what so many people in this country. Um, he also had a, I like to tell the story, he had a cigar box, and I said, candy? I was seven. And no, your mom and I plan on having more kids, which totally went over my head. Um, uh, and a year and a half later, he showed up um, when my brother was being born in Frankfurt, Germany, and had that cigar box under his arm. And he said, uh, I want to speak to the head nurse. And back in those days, the head nurses were all female and could beat any of the four of us nine out of ten times in arm wrestling. Um, and he said, in this box is dirt from America and you will put it under the mattress where my child is being born because my child is gonna be born on American soil. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what we've lost in this country. Um, uh, and it's because, quite frankly, the politicians are failing on moving the ball forward on all fronts. You know, maybe one moves a little bit more than another, um, but, but they don't understand the basics of problem solving, which our forefathers did, which is you talk about the problem, you talk about the solution, you create a solution, you implement a solution, but you do that cautiously because you know those solutions may create unintended consequences. And we never stop anymore to think about the unintended consequences. And the Senate, which was the purpose to slow down on that process, is now used to stop everything so the other side doesn't get credit. And so um, the problem with the lack of solving problems is when you don't fix people's problems, not only does their trust in government and the trust in institutions go down, they become cynical. And cynical voters become susceptible to demagoguery. They follow demagoguery in their cynicism. And whether it's, whether it's demagoguery on cable news or de demagoguery in social media or demagoguery coming from the super PACs or from some of our presidential candidates, that demagoguery divides rather than brings people together. Lewis, I, I take the liberty of assuming that you are the youngest member of the panel. <laughs> correct me <laughs> that if is, I'm mistaken. That is correct. I, I, I would think so. <laughs> um, what, Unfortunately, what we're not giving him enough competition. <laughs> <Yeah>. right <now. laughs> uh, what, what do you think uh, has, has changed? And what elements of the experience of younger people um, might create a sense of polarization, of cynicism, perhaps, mm -hmm. or other um, uh, forms of disengagement? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand that my introduction into politics is relatively recent compared to the elder statesmen um, who, who are here. Uh, it's <laughs> nice of you to add that second word. Yeah. <laughs> we we well, didn't sound much like elder statesmen. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, and, and I mean that because you have to consider that my introduction to politics came by virtue of the 1994 crime bill. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I saw my community plagued by the crack cocaine epidemic. I saw my community being over-policed. When my parents were incarcerated, when I was five years old, we had a strong disdain and a strong distrust towards politicians and towards government overall. And so, lo and behold, when it's, I don't, I'm not even engaged civically in voting and or the like thereof until after I serve 14 years in federal prison. Pause for the uh, collective audience gasp. <gasps> after I served 14 years in federal prison, it was then by which I said to myself, I have to be more civically engaged. And that civic engagement actually came on the heels, or I should say during the election, of the 45th president of this country, then um, uh, Donald J. Trump. And so I think that one of two things happened. Number one, I saw, I was a casual observer, and I missed the 2008 Obama ch hope and change wave. I missed that movement. Then I come home, and there seems to be a referendum, depending on whatever way you look at it. 
I don't know if that was a cue for me to set, shut up. <laughs> this is a great rain. Yeah. <laughs> so there seemed to be a referendum either on the uh, election of President uh, Obama and or there was a strong endorsement of President Trump. And so I just knew that at that particular point in time, I wanted to do something. I didn't know what that something was. Uh, and so what I ended up doing was, A, I got in, not only did I get involved civically, but I convinced the largest city in the state of Connecticut, where I'm from, that they need a government office for reentry affairs to help people who have been justice impacted. Not only through that, but I also use that office to register people who have been justice impacted to vote, to get involved, irrespective to, of whoever your candidate of choice was, to get involved in far more than not. I heard people tell me, Lewis, I don't want to get involved because these people don't care about us. The only time that they show up to our churches, the only time that they show up to our communities, the only time that they want photo ops is when it's around election time. And so I have in effect found by being relatively young um, and having children who are relatively young that people are just dispirited by the nastiness of politics. And they're also disenfranchised by what the notion of the institution of politics actually stand for. So different understandings of the cause of the problem can point toward different treatments. And I want to talk about some of the general strategies that have been so suggested by you in other works and also um, by others. And the first is an appeal to empathy to the idea that we should learn more about each other and that in getting to know each other better, uh, we will learn to respect each other, mm -hmm. if not to agree. Will that help? Absolutely. It, 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 talk about unintended co consequences. All this began in about 1992, 1994, in that time period, that um, in the name of uh, making them more responsive. Newt Gingrich came up with the idea that voting would move from being Monday through Friday to Tuesday to Thursday so that people could spend more time back in their district or their state. People and meaning members of Congress. Members of Congress. But what that began doing is members of Congress then stopped bringing their family to Washington. And I remember in those early days, I used to coach with my kids uh, baseball and basketball. And I always had a congressman from one side of the aisle and a congressman from the other side of the aisle that had kids on the team. And they'd be there at the games and they'd be rooting for their kids together. They don't do that anymore. They don't re react because supposedly they set all these laws where not only are they not here as much, but they can't be sponsored to go off on weekends together because it looked bad. So they were buying influence. They weren't buying influence. They were trying to get those members to become friendly and understand each other so that then they could work on things. If you remember, um, it, it's uh, stories about Reagan um, and Tip O'Neill getting together after a fight and how much that brought legislation together um, was, was, uh, uh, was just historic in terms of what they talked about in the early 80s. We don't have that anymore. Now there is a group called the Bipartisan Policy Center that has begun doing a thing where they raise money and send a Republican senator or, or a congressman to a Democrat's district and then that Democrat comes to the Republican's district for a week. And there are some signs that's starting to get these guys to deal with each other and to talk to each other more. That's a good first step, but we need a lot more of that. We need a whole lot more of that. I want, I want to jump Please. on that for a second. So when I was at an organization called Cut 50 um, that was co-founded by Van Jones, I built the nation's largest bipartisan coalition of its kind. Um, and it was for people who had been justice impacted, people who are, were in substance abuse recovery, and people who had been survivors and or victims of crime. And ironically, the name of that coalition is called the Empathy Network. And because, the reason being is we named it as such is because we realized that empathy is really about not feeling sorry for someone, but putting myself in somebody else's shoes, taking my perspective 
and setting it to the side and just listening with an open, empathic heart to say, how is it that you grew up? Help me understand where you are coming from. And as a result of such, not only did we, were we, have, been a, have we been able to pass uh, collectively over the last five, bill, uh, five years or so more than 30 bills and create a pathway to freedom for more than 500,000 people, but ultimately, I'll tell you a very quick story. I was in an unnamed senator's office when we were uh, lobbying for the First Step Act. And when we were in his office, I pulled out of my shoe my prison identification card. And he said, why did you pull that out of your shoe? I said, not only for dramatic flair, uh, because I have a flair for the dramatics. I said, when I came, when I was released from federal prison, I snuck this out. And he asked me, why did you sneak it out? And I said, because on the top of it, it says property of the United States government. And if I would have gotten <laughs> caught sneaking this, if I would have got caught with it, I would have gotten a disciplinary report for stealing. And he said, so why did you want an ID? And I explained to him, I wanted some, something to verify who I was and validate who I was as, as a returning citizen at the time. And so I began to tell my story about how my parents were incarcerated, how I you know, was involved in criminal enterprising, and how I was involved in you know, the streets, et cetera. And then afterwards, he told me, he asked everyone else to leave out, and he said, Lewis, I want to ask you a question. He said, if I share something with you, you can never disclose it publicly in terms of who it came from. I said, I promise. He said, I have a nephew who's incarcerated. He said, my wife and I send my nephew money and we send him books every month anonymously. He said, after this conversation, not only am I going to lean towards voting for this bill, but I'm also not going to send my nephew uh, uh, packages anonymously. And so it was through an empathic conversation that I was able to just move this person from one end of the spectrum to another end of the spectrum. And I think that that is what we need, not in politics, but I think that that's also what we need in society as well. But I, I, I would also add, campaigns have become, um, you know, I used to love Ronald Reagan. I mean, when he came out with something. I'm too young to remember. He, 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 he wanted Reagan. <laughs> and he, I'm old enough to have voted yeah. against him. <laughs> but he would always talk about why he was for something, not why he's against something. Mm -hmm. All our campaigns today are about what they're against on both sides. Mm -hmm. And both sides are equally bad. And all they want to talk about is what they're against, which plays to the negative and doesn't educate people on policies that would, act, in fact, help them mm -hmm. by talking about what they're for. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things we need to do, and I, I, I bump heads with, uh, you know, I was a pollster strategist. I used to bump heads with, I hated the media people who would say, we do negative, you know, I'm sure everyone's heard this, we do negative because it works. My response to them is, so does positive, you gotta try it once in a while. Mm -hmm. And I built my entire career on running positive campaigns and walked away with, when I retired last year, 54 members of the House, 14 senators, and nine governors that were our clients that got elected in that 22 election that wasn't supposed to be a great election. And I got there by convincing those guys to campaign about what they're for, mm -hmm. not to campaign about what they're against. So a couple of things on this. One is, I do think negative campaigning goes way back and is not a, a recent development. I mean, we've, I've we lived with it all my life. And, and you can look through American history and there's been a lot of negative uh, campaigning at different uh, moments. I used to say that if uh, products advertised uh, the way campaigns did, uh, the campaigns have become a whole um, set of advertising against the very system itself. It would be McDonald's saying, don't go to Burger King, you'll get food poisoning. <laughs> or it would be an airline saying, don't fly that other airline, the plane will crash. That's, and so if you wonder how we built up all of this mistrust in the system, so I agree with that, but I, I do think it, it, it goes back a long way. And just to your earlier point, I agree with you about problem solving and the decline of problem solving very much. On the other hand, I, I actually see the trajectory of my lifetime as largely a positive trajectory compared to what the country was like when I was born. When I was born, we were a much more racist country. We were a segregated country in large parts of our country. Uh, older people didn't have Medicare. 
uh, uh, Medicare, we didn't have Medicaid, we didn't have Obamacare. We, there were a lot of things we didn't have, and going back to the crime bill, um, we didn't have the Black Lives Matter movement, which re made us realize what was wrong with that crime bill. And I understand why it passed. People were scared to death of very high crime rates, and they were. They, we were in a uh, period of uh, high crime rates, but the solution was had more unintended consequences than anyone wanted to look at, especially because the unintended consequences tended to be uh, against the most left out people in society. But on empathy, I think um, em you know, the empathy sounds like really a soft thing. Uh, and a friend of mine once rebelled against the idea of, you know, oh, if the people only got to know each other better, they'd understand each other. And my friend said, maybe if they got to know each other better, they'd really understand why they hate each other. And, you know, but I, I, don't, I don't view empathy that way. I view empathy as an active effort by each of us to step in the shoes of someone else. It's a discipline. Um, and um, a, a friend of mine, my friend Jim Kloppenberg, who wrote a book on the democratic idea and where it came from, likes to say that, that uh, democracy really requires us to follow St. Paul and that we should think with each other's minds and see with each other's eyes that empathy is not this sort of feel-good thing, it's a discipline that we are called upon to engage uh, as uh, citizens who respect each other and believe that each of us, every one of us, has a right to be treated with equal dignity. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I think that's very true. And first of all, in terms of negative campaigns, I think it's very interesting. With the exception of one TV spot, there was not a negative TV spot in a presidential campaign until Bush in 92. It was positive on both sides. Positive on both sides. You're thinking sides. of LBJ and the bomb? That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that was kind of questionable. It only ran, what, two or three times. Um, but, you know, I used to, when I was actually running campaigns, I would meet with a congressman and someone that says they want to, to run, for, run for a district, and I'd make them go out for two or three months and travel around this, the district and take notes. What's Main Street look like? What's the school system look like? What are people like in the various towns? What's the difference between Main Street in this town and Main Street in this town? Go to a diner not to talk to people, but to listen to what they're talking about. To understand the people you're gonna ask to vote for you because you need to know do you connect with them. Today, um, I got to where the last couple of years when I would go into a campaign, if the first thing they had done was an opposition research, I turned around and walked out the door because they're already on the wrong mindset of why they're in this race. It's to connect with people, it's not to destroy your enemy. That's good, that's good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. How do you think social media and other technological changes have, in, have uh, contributed to empathy or the deficit of empathy um, in, in one sense, we have more opportunities to talk to people, to listen to people, to find out about them than we ever before, uh, than we ever did before. But it seems in practice that what we like to do is yell at each other. Mm -hmm. the, the anonymous part of has been very negative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people stop to think. I did a. a, a a fellowship at Georgetown on, on civility. And I had two hardcore Democrats that were assigned to me to work during that fellowship. And in the very last session, they said, we finally got it. And the last week we went to like something and realized that what we were about ready to like was very snarky and negative. And we realized we we're adding to the negative out there. We we're adding to the snarkiness. If you add on top of that the anonymous part of it, that people could say things thinking they're being cute as opposed to actually saying something of substance. Um, the algorithms that are used to keep pushing the same stories to the same people. And I would add in that same thing, uh, the cable news. I mean, anything on any of the three cable news programs after eight o'clock at night is nothing but demagoguery. 
and I worked a lot of campaigns with Roger Ailes before he went to, to Fox News. He, he was not pushing a political agenda. He had a strategy of create a silo of people that you keep reinforcing the same message so you keep them following that. It was about money. It wasn't about politics. And MSNBC and unfortunately now CNN has also followed that same model. Lewis, do you want to add to that? Look, I, I, I don't think that I could have articulated that um, better, better, better than uh, Ed did. I, I think that when you look at the anonymity on social media where you can have people who got Twitter fingers, <laughs> right? Like when I was a kid and you had a problem with somebody or you had a problem with something, you said it with your chest and you said it to their face. Now you can hide behind Twitter, um, you can hide behind Instagram, and you can kind of like be what we call where I'm from, these social media gangsters. Um, and, and you can create these, these, these fake accounts and you can just either um, reinforce what's neg negativity, you can start these brush fires where there's no traceability. And what ends up happening is that you have no accountability, and when you have no accountability, people aren't responsible to anything or anyone, which in turn is going to, in effect, demoralize um, other, other people. I mean, we're not even talking about from a political perspective, even when you look at cyberbullying. Right, it's 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 a version of what's happening. It's a, it's a microcosm of what's happening on the on the on on the larger uh, uh, political uh, scale. And so I just think that when you add add algorithms, when you add that anonym, an, an, anonymity piece, and when you just have add the that the fact that people haven't grown up with just good home training, <laughs> right? I was raised by my grandmama. I was raised to open doors for women and I was raised to walk on the ins outside of the sidewalk. Um, and you just don't have that anymore. Um, this is what you get. The, the result is going to be nastiness. The result is going to be people trying to ex exploit uh, all of these divides and ultimately people staying more in their silos than actually coming together. We need more grandmamas on social media. Yeah, I, that's, that's, that's the fact of the matter. We need more I grandmamas like that, on that. social media. I wish you could legislate that. <laughs> um, so back when, you know, if you write a newspaper column, you hear a lot from readers, and readers tend to write you more when they disagree than when they agree. And back in the day when people wrote nice hate mail, uh, I got one that began, Dear Mr. Dion, are you as dumb in person? And now I share that with you tonight because if you get nothing else out of what I say tonight, you'll at least be able to answer that question for yourself. But I'm, I sort of think, I've, I have thought a lot about trying to find the balance between the joys of what we can do now, the information that we have available to us through this new technology, which is truly startling. The ability to enter into worlds that aren't yours, uh, you know, a black Twitter, all the subcultures mm -hmm. on Twitter and, and, and other social media, at their best, mm -hmm. they really give people an entree, or sports Twitter and, and, and sports social media, I particularly love because it allows people to crisscross their usual political divides. Mm -hmm. I, uh, on Twitter, I just I got a whole bunch of, uh, briefly, a bunch of right-wing Red Sox fans when my dear Red Sox were in the World Series, and I'll never forget the night we won. Somebody said, I guess I'll have to go back to hating everything E.J. writes tomorrow, <laughs> and writes now, and I wrote back and said, oh, come on, wait till tomorrow morning. But there are wonderful things that are happening out there that are parallel to the hatred everybody described. But I do think that the way in which social media has started working is that it does bring out the worst and the most popular. I found that when I tweet out one of my columns, if it's, if it's a really sharp retort to someone, it's a more popular, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a more popular tweet than if it is more measured, although nothing beats dog tweets, by the way. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, uh, dogs, my, my daughter took a beautiful picture, one of our daughters took a beautiful picture of our dog. I tweeted that out and it beat my column 10 to one. Um, <laughs> and, but so I, I think that this does go to what Ed talked about in terms of, it does seem to encourage 
um, a particularly angry kind of interchange, and I think you're really seeing that around the war in Gaza uh, and around reactions to that. I think that there has been so much, um, you know, a real difficulty to go back to the empathy, to empathize with how Israel felt when that attack happened, this evil attack, and to empathize with Palestinians in Gaza, and that it ought to be possible for human beings to understand the history here is very complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can react passionately as I did when Israel came under attack. And I thought you had to condemn that as an act of terrorism. But it is also quite possible to feel at the same time um, for uh, the people of Gaza. I think social media make it very hard mm -hmm. to have anything like a complicated human response mm -hmm. to a, 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 a fight like that. I have yeah. to mention the dog thing. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so two weeks ago, I took a picture. I have an 83-pound golden doodle. And when you make him take a picture and stand there, he gets this sad look on his face. And I'd taken this bumper sticker that said, with him with his sad face, and put it down by his legs. And it said, I'm anti-Trump because I'm anti-stupid. <laughs> I sent it to my wife. And she said, don't you dare put that on social media. <laughs> I was, that would be that would get, that would hit all the buttons. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to suggest one of two things. Number one, EJ should probably write more uh, articles with the dog picture, as, as yeah. <laughs> it would be clickbait. Yeah, it uh, might not have been about the dog. It might have just been about my column. You know? uh, the, the other thing is, I, I just thought about is that you know, in the palm of our hands, we have more technological advancement than the United States had to put the first man on the moon. Yeah. Think about that. In the palm of our hands, we have more technological advancement than the United States did to put the first man on the moon. What are we doing with it? What are we doing with all of that power? What are we doing with all of that, intellect, that, that, that technological uh, prowess? What are we doing with that? Are we using it to, again, push people into corners, or are we using it, or should we be using it in order to bridge these, these divides? Well, EJ, I don't know if you could uh, ever do it, but getting them to stop using algorithms yeah. would be a major step in that yeah. direction. Well, this, this actually brings up um, another strategy that's often mentioned in these discussions. So it's sometimes said that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And that leads to an argument that the problem here is that people are not fully informed or perhaps that they are even misinformed. They think they know things that they don't. Um, how should we consider education, not only in the formal sense, but in the informal sense, um, as contributing to, again, not eliminating differences, but making them more manageable? One of the things that I'm really worried about is to start with is uh, the collapse of local media, local newspapers mm -hmm. around the country, uh, where, um, Local, local newspapers were not only important to self-government, keeping the town, the city, the state, the county accountable, uh, they were also very, they were responsible for building community in the place and dealing with problem solving and watch, sort of talking about how a community was coming together to solve problems and talking about actually the rich number of uh, associations in places that the president talked about that, are, that do stuff uh, every day. It wasn't a bad thing to have some of those pictures of the Rotary Club or the Boy Scouts uh, or the NAACP or whatever other group was out there. So that's for a second. We do not have, um, you know, think of what's happened to the media since, say, 1970, where um, we all used to watch the same TV news at, from 6.30 to 7 o'clock at night, and they had huge audiences. Now, that meant that choice was constrained, it's true, and we have all kinds of other options now, and that, on the one hand, that's a great thing, but there was a general sense that people reading their papers, uh, national and local, looking at television, listening to radio, they tended, not always, but they tended to agree, all right, here are the facts. Now we'll argue about them. I think what's happened now um, is that there is not the same shared sense of fact and that people are more divided. Again, we've always had conspiracy 
theorists in the United States going back to the beginning, but I think people can really live in a world that is a totally different information world from each other. I, I'll quibble this. I, I don't think this is my a difference in politics. I do think uh, CNN and MSNBC are in some sense different from Fox in terms of being news organizations, but we don't have to go there. Uh, but we do, but, but your point is correct that people on the other side of it is that people of particular views watch one or the other. They rarely watch both. And just one anecdote, I, back when blogging started, I teach a class on media and politics and policy, and I asked my students, I listed a bunch of bloggers on the left and a bunch of bloggers on the right, and I said, you know, what do you, you know, do you follow any of these? And, you know, most of the liberal kids raised their hand, uh, for one set, the others raised their hand for another set, and one kid, one student in the whole class raised his hand for both. And I said, good for you. And he said, well, not really. I have a side job at CNN where my, my job is to read all the blogs on both sides <laughs> of politics. <laughs> and I, I would go back to, again, that if the information they're hearing is what people are against, as opposed to what they're for, that's misinformation. And I think one of the things that, I mean, Tucker Carlson, um, he should have been run out as a journalist because he not only wrote stories that weren't true, he wrote stories that he knew was not true. That's not misinformation, that's disinformation. And no journalist should be allowed to get away with that. And just to make the point, you, it is possible I think you need to hold people who write opinion, I write opinion, to the same standards you hold people who don't write opinion, which is to say, you can disagree with every word I write, but you ought to be able to trust that the facts in there are true, unless I've made a mistake, in which case I'll honor them, I'll acknowledge the mistake. And I think too often there's like, well, once it's opinion, fact doesn't matter. No, fact really matters in yeah. opinion. Yeah. Is there a risk, do you think, in using the categories of mis- and disinformation that you've just introduced? So some people would say, well, it's all misinformation when you disagree with it. But if you agree, it becomes more plausible. And sometimes it turns out later on that the consensus of one moment uh, is mistaken in some way. Um, how, do we, how do we balance a concern for responsible journalism um, and the dissemination of accurate, or as best as we can tell, accurate information um, with a concern for freedom, which includes the freedom to criticize, to be unpopular, and maybe even to be wrong. Quite simply, my definition of misinformation is passing on information that is incorrect without you knowing it's incorrect. It becomes disinformation if you decide to pass it on knowing it's incorrect, because then you're trying to change people's minds with in incorrect information. So I think you can keep it fairly simple in terms of that. But part of the problem is, is that so many, I mean, the, the three cable networks, and yes, you're right, MSNBC, they used to only watch MSNBC. Fox, they used to only watch Fox. Uh, 10 years ago, people that watched CNN would sometimes watch Fox, sometimes watch MSNBC, no more. Now all three are in a silo of different people that only watch those stations. Of course, all of cable is on the decline now anyway because we're just streaming and, and the right, like, but that's right. another story. Um, <laughs> that's until our candidates really get going in this election. Um, but I don't know how to correct it because so much that, the first thing that has gone with newspapers, for example, is their research departments. They're gone. They don't have money for it anymore. And so they are not reinforcing what they're putting out there with solid information being checked in so many of the newspapers. I'm talking about the local newspapers as opposed to some of the bigger ones. Well, I, I think there's, I just think it's the disappearance of people in the business altogether that you're seeing. Uh, in that respect. I, I, I take your point, I think there's something underlying your question which is uh, something we should think about, which is if the facts are unclear or if you might have a different view if you arrange real facts in a different way, uh, you shouldn't accuse somebody of engaging in disinformation as long as they're dealing 
in reality, but I, I agree with Ed's distinction that I think, you know, people make mistakes. I mean, if you are covering a big story uh, live, uh, you know, a, a shooting, a hurricane, whatever, you get information as it comes, and then the authorities or you or the people gathering it correct themselves. That misinformation happens to all of us all the time in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, disinformation really is active efforts to deceive uh -huh. by people who know what they're doing. And that, I think, is happening uh, out there, and that's a real problem. Going back to your point about bloggers, even when you think about these so-called now citizen journalists, these are people who haven't gone through the discipline. They don't understand the integrity of the editorial process, et cetera. And so now what you can do is based off of my feelings and or based off of me not necessarily liking this person or liking this issue, I can now put up anything online. And if I have a strong enough following, I can get that, fo I can get that following to perpetuate that, that disinformation, which in effect can be harmful, not only to causes, not only to people, not only to issues ad infinitum, but the fact of the matter is that what it does is it now has, it's, all, it's almost like whack-a-mole. You have these other uh, so-called citizen journalists who pop up and they intentionally spread disinformation. Although it's also true that citizen journalists can show stuff that other people don't. In other words, mm -hmm. I think it's a tricky, yeah. it's a really tricky yeah. thing because yeah. This, you're right that sometimes that's what happens, but other times they're telling stories that, other, that others aren't telling mm -hmm. and showing the world parts of life that others, others won't see. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense they can be useful. I'm really worried as, as local newspapers decline, people are stepping in with very partisan newspapers. Now I'm not against the partisan parts of the media. Our whole media system, we forget that we, before there were uh, you know, so, supposedly balanced newspapers, all our press was partisan, a Hamiltonian paper to take on a Jeffersonian paper. Mm -hmm. I think partisan media has its role uh, but when you are replacing pure information media with partisan media, mm -hmm. and, and in so many cases not labeled as such, uh, you're losing something. And yeah. I think you know, the death of the local newspaper that tried, you know, imperfectly, but did, you know, many of them did a great job of covering their communities, mm -hmm. that's a real loss. So when I ask my students what they think uh, should be done uh, to repair the civil fabric. Um, they always answer, nine of 10 times, education. And they, they say that, I think, partly because they've spent their lives in school and it seems very important to them, whereas these other possibilities are a little bit um, more, more abstract. But I also think that it reflects a very deep American tendency to see classroom education as a transformative experience and to see schools as a factory for citizens. This is a rhetoric that you, you find um, quite frequently in, in American political culture. Is there anything that schools and universities like this should be doing that they aren't or doing better than they're doing now? Put civility or civics classes back <laughs> in the schools. You know, it's just not non-existent. It is non-existent in our school system today. I, I was I was also going to add as well. It, it should happen earlier on, um, <laughs> at at the earlier ages in school, rather than in in post-secondary education. The other thing is is that when was the last time you've walked into maybe a public uh, K through eight school and you saw a debate class, right? People don't know how to have healthy debates. Children don't know how to, how to debate an issue. Um, even having a healthy argument, we don't know how to be disruptive thinkers. We go with the herd. Um, and so we argue from a fact, from a, from a space of feelings more than we argue from a space of facts. And, and, and we have to have that balance there. And so if we're going to have um, th these healthy discussions, especially as, especially as we get older, then it has to, we have to train uh, children at a far much more earlier age how to, how to engage civically and also ha how to have healthy, healthier debates. Now, I, I will say this back, the, the book that Selena and I wrote, uh, first of all, it's a question of respect. We started off to write about civility 
And we came to understand that civility is just the language of respect. Yeah. So I think part of it is, is putting more emphasis on respect of each other, as opposed to just being civil mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. The other is that we had had lots of survey questions that, you know, who do you put hope on our country turning this around? And the number one response is young people. And what was interesting is that young people said, obviously they felt they were the answer. Seniors, surprisingly, thought they were the answer. But the group that was upside down negative about young people were millennials. And we couldn't figure out why, we couldn't get through to it. But the disappointment we had, one of the things I think we did right in the book is the first nine chapters, we wrote about just the problem as opposed to the solution. Because I wanted to see how big of a wall we built and not be Pollyannish on our talking about kids. And it's lucky we did that. Because in talking to the kids when we were putting together that last chapter, and the kids I'm talking about college educated or young adults, um, college educated, not college educated, by gender, by race, every young person answered the same way on respect. I will respect someone else if they respect me first. And in today's world, well, in any world, that's not the way it works. And so one of the conclusions we had, and I would say this to this group tonight, if you're here interested in pushing civility, is we need leaders that are gonna stand as examples and light the way, much in the way that Ronald Reagan did for me, that, that John McCain did for me, and none of the politicians. I mean, the reason why I was anti-Trump before he was even president is I understood as working in politics all my life that he was gonna define what a Republican meant. You see it in the press every day today. And that's not who I was. So I was against him for no other reason than he was gonna define me in a way I didn't want to be defined as. On, on, the, on young people, I, I always, our kids are 31, 29, 26, and I always tell them that I'm actually not worried about the country in the long run because I do have enormous confidence in the rising generation. I've been teaching for 20 years, and I tell them, you know, when my generation is gone and you're running the place, I think it'll be okay. And the only problem with that theory is I want to be around to see it, and so there's a contradiction. <laughs> there's a contradiction there. Um, I think that uh, the other fun conversation along those lines, which some of you might have, is there are two millennials and one zeer in our family, and they were having this fierce argument about millennials and zeers. And I said, this is great. You're not attacking the boomers. And they all said, oh, no, we all hate the boomers. And then they, I, I thought we had a divide and conquer strategy available, but it didn't work. On education, I, on, on the one hand, I'm always suspicious of it in a way because whenever we can't solve a problem, we say, well, education will solve it. On the other hand, I think it is clearly the case uh, that uh, the schools can do more to help. I think in a couple of respects, they should, we should have civics education that also involves what some have called media literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various names for it, but how do you consume information in this unusual time where all the information systems are changing on you? And anybody who's looked at like the AP history, you know, AP state, federal, local government curriculum in a school, that's a great curriculum. It doesn't have to be an AP class. It could easily be generalized to all students, so I do think that's part of it. But I also think that people who teach have an obligation to encourage within their classrooms a uh, debate where people feel, on the one hand, free to express their views, uh, but on the other hand, be genuinely respectful mm -hmm. to everyone else in the class. And a lot of our free speech on campus arguments are about where does disagreement cross the line into being disrespectful. And I always tell my students that um, I, you know, uh, there are, in every room there is a minority and a majority, uh, and that the ma majority cannot try to shut down the minority, and if it ever happens, I'll side with the minority no matter what their views are. But I think we've got to figure out how to have real, respectful, real argument, mm -hmm. a serious argument, people really disagreeing, 
um, but do it in a way that, uh, you know, that, that reflects respect and in, at least in principle an ability to be persuaded. Studies show that faculty and administrators, particularly in higher education, but to a lesser extent also in, in K-12, um, lean distinctly to the left, particularly on so-called cultural issues. And that lean has been cited as one of the causes of growing educational polarization. People who have college degrees or graduate degrees uh, tend to uh, vote for Democrats and tend to describe themselves as being on the left at increasingly high rates. So would it be helpful to change the curriculum, hiring, or other practices to include conservative teachers or speakers or points of view where they're not otherwise being heard? Well, I think some, that split that you're talking about reflects who chooses which professions. Uh, that Republicans, among educated people, you know, people who have had the blessing of higher education, um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of more conservative people may go into business, may go into the professions, may not want to go uh, into higher education. So I don't think you can, I, I think you're going to see a tilt uh, to the liberal side in that profession, no matter what you do. Um, in terms of the obligations of, I, I, in, in this little spiel I give, I always, you know, by saying I don't um, try not to indoctrinate in my classes, I write a column so you can see what I think on anything, and then I also finally conclude by saying nothing I've learned turns students quicker into conservatives than doctrinaire liberal professors. Uh, and I had a conservative kid come up to me afterward and say he really appreciated my lecture about openness. He said, you're still trying to turn us into liberals. You're just <laughs> smarter about it, uh, he told me. But I think we should, I bring conservatives into my classes. The kids know what I think. They know what my views are. I don't, I don't I'm not heavy on them, but they're just out there. Um, and I try to bring in voices that are different than mine, and, uh, different, and not just in ideology either, just different kinds of people, and I think that can, be, that can be helpful, and we should, you know, if we can't have good arguments in universities, where can we have them? Yeah. And I, you look like you're on the verge of a <laughs> remark. <laughs> well, um, I go back to be what we're for, not what we're against. Mm -hmm. And um, I was brought in in January last year um, to speak to the Ripon Society, which is the centrist Republicans as opposed to the, the far right. Um, and they brought in Ed Meekham, who had just finished writing his book about Lincoln. And I learned more from listening to him because he gave them a lecture that I wish every member of Congress could hear on both sides of the aisle, which was you need to understand the brilliance of our founding fathers. You need to understand the brilliance of our founding fathers. And without putting blame on them, it was a time that not everyone was included under that brilliance. And your responsibility, and he was talking to the Republican senators, your responsibility is to now make sure everyone is included under that brilliance. And I thought it was one of the best things I've ever heard said about government, because all too often, in order to talk about others being included, we downplay or attack the brilliance as not being good, mm -hmm. as opposed to understanding part of this was good because of the times, whatever the blame is, they didn't include everybody, but your job is to make sure everyone's included now. And that way, both sides are satisfied. And I think it's the same on the teacher, is to teach it in terms of not what's wrong and how do we right these wrongs, but let's take the brilliance and make sure it's to everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, am, I think a lot about this issue of the founders. And if you look at the most persuasive arguments people made for change, they were arguments over what the founders intended or implicitly promised. And if you listen to what Lincoln's whole argument with Douglas was that the founders in the end did not believe that slavery should survive. And Martin Luther King's speeches were powerful 
because they appealed simultaneously to scripture, uh, Amos, Amos, you know, Amos, Micah, uh, Isaiah, and the Declaration of Independence. So that's all true on the one side. On the other side, I don't think it is wrong for us to understand that the founders were politicians. The founders made a lot of compromises to put the countries together. The founders were we to the founders were brilliant, but we have had brilliant people all through our history. And to me, the founders were the, would be the first to say that you should be ready to change the system that we created. Heck, they changed the Electoral College within 20 years of the Constitution because it didn't work right the first time, and yet we've been unwilling to make any changes in the Electoral College all these years later. So that I, I think that I, I want to honor and not deify the founders, I guess, but that's a long conversation. But it does... But the conversation you, know, you were saying a minute ago is you, you said to not have the majority impose their will on the minority. Right. And that was the brilliance of the founding fathers. They made us a republic, not a democracy. Yeah, I, I, we disagree. We, that's a whole other yeah. argument. I, I, I think we're a democratic republic and that we weren't at the beginning and we became more democratic through our history and thank God for it. <laughs> One of the things that student, I'm, I'm a professor, so I talk a lot about students and the things that I teach them. I apologize. It's good uh, that if you care about tedious. students. <laughs> but one of the things that students often find surprising and sometimes frustrating in studying the early republic and the constitutional founding is how much the debates revolve around institutions and procedures rather than issues as we, as we now understand them. Mm -hmm. um, what institutions and procedures might we change or try to change to get better outcomes? Because it sometimes seems in panels like this that everyone has wonderful ideas and many suggestions, and yet it never quite turns out. And often, I, I submit, that's for um, concrete institutional and material reasons. So, newspapers can't function as they once did because the advertising just isn't there. Yeah. The revenue isn't there. It's not because someone decided Correct. Uh, out of peak that they were going to stop editing uh, their, their reporters. Members of Congress or other politicians might like to compromise more, but they also know that they can get in trouble with their primary voters, and they're reluctant to do that because they would like to remain in office. What kinds of institutional or structural changes should we consider that, again, might help us get closer to some of these goals? L let me address that, and we talked a little bit about, about it earlier. Um, we have a question that we asked in surveys about, and we have two ways. Do you want your member of Congress to fight for your values even if it means they do nothing or accomplish nothing? Or do you want your member of Congress to compromise in order to find solutions to our daily problems? By 68 to 30, they say compromise. But what has changed out there, and this maybe gets to you what, what we need to look at changing, is that in 1990, 35% of Republicans voted in the Republican primary, and 35% of Democrats voted in the Democrat primary. In 2022, 17% of Republicans voted in the Republican primaries, and only 15% of Democrats voted in the Democrat primaries. In the Iowa caucus last week, 14.4% of Republicans participated in that caucus. And yet they talked about in the news media that this represented the new Republican Party that is all Trump. The problem is, is that that 30% who's voting in the two primaries are the ones that are saying fight, don't give up on your values. And so even if the member is not leaning in that direction, they, they know they're constantly looking over their shoulder for if I do not put up the fight that they want, as opposed to find solutions and compromise for solutions, I'm gonna be voted out of office. Now, whether that's right or wrong, should they worry about that, is a no, whole nother discussion. But if we don't find a way to get 
participation in picking the nominees up, we're gonna to continue to go further and further to the far right and the far left. Because um, quite frankly, as much as we may complain about them not compromising and not finding solutions, that cake is already baked by the time the primaries are over. To, uh, just a quick side note, and then a thank you for inviting something I want, want to say anyway. Uh, the, the side note is the, um, the evidence, we can argue about this if you want, but we don't have to, uh, that I think the evidence is that the Republicans have moved farther right than Democrats have moved left. Half the Democrats or more are still moderates or even conservative, whereas three quarters of the Republic, two thirds of the Republicans are conservative. So, and that Democrats are more likely to say they're for compromise than Republicans, partly because Democrats want government to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think this is asymmetric. But the, what you invited is um, a friend and I wrote a book with a, what some might say is a rather radical reform called, uh, back in 20, not 2022, called 100% Democracy, where we argued that the US should adopt Australia's system of compulsory electoral participation. We call it universal voting. We don't use the compulsory word because being good Americans, everybody could apply to be a conscientious objector if they really, really, really didn't want to vote. But uh, you know, in the under the Australia, the fine is small, and most people don't have to pay it because if they give a legitimate excuse, it's a like a twenty dollar fine. Uh, but they have, and then they make it easy for people to vote, easy for people to register. So they get 96% registered and about 90% of them vote. Uh, I, I'm happy to talk to anybody or argue with anybody because a lot of people, uh, we, we were so honest or stupid that we did a poll that found only 26% of Americans supported our idea, but we found about half of Americans might be persuaded. I think there were a lot of structural reforms in the system that would help, I think, that, um, um, uh, th that uh, rank choice voting can actually be helpful. Uh, it might be able to empower, um, in some cases it might empower the center, but in all cases it would give a gr better reflection of uh, what people think because um, you know, you could, if, if you, you, right now, if you vote for the candidate you like most who's not going to win, you might elect the candidate you like least. With ranked choice voting, if you're a Green or a Libertarian, you could put a one next to them, but then your two might end up electing the candidate, but then you'd elect by majority. Um, I think that I would get rid of the Electoral College if I could, but it's very, it's, it's very difficult, uh, very difficult to do. And I would like to see ways in which it would be made through the tax law and other ways much easier to support local journalism. I'd like to see if there were ways to facilitate philanthropy, community-based newspapers. Um, there, there have to be ways to rescue this really, to me, really vital form of communication and community building. By the way, to rank order voting, another benefit of that in the cases where that's happened is it lowers the negativism yes, in exactly. the campaign because you have no idea if uh, the person you're attacking will be out and you th then need their vote. If yeah, and we, we, my friend Miles Rapport and I argue the same is true of universal voting yep. because the voters who aren't in tend to be less ideological. And so you're not just spending all your time turning out your base, you're right. actually having to appeal to the entire uh, electorate. And it would bring in, it would likely make the electorate um, you know, a black turnout is high, but it would be higher. A Latino turnout would be higher. Young turnout would be higher. And also, we argue it wouldn't necessarily have a political effect because white working class voters would also be higher. So the politics of it might balance out, but we're for it regardless of what the politics are. And just so you know, in a presidential year, only 70% of eligible voters vote. In a non-presidential year, only 40%. Less right. than half this country votes in those elections. Although when we made it, yes, correct. But when we made it easier for people to vote during the pandemic, turnout went up. Now granted, it was a consequential election, Trump, Biden. But uh, it, we can make it much easier for people to vote and we should. Mm -hmm. Lewis, you were, you were too polite to interrupt, so I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so when I was thinking about just the notion about um, structural changes to institutions, it has a different connotation for me, yeah. especially considering where it is that I come from. 
Um, number one, where I come from, you have people who are just as impacted that are locked out of the vote. Right. And yeah. so before you even get to the polls, you have to get over the hurdle in order to be able to vote. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that I also think about I also think about diversity um, in, within these within these institutions. We need, for instance, ev even as I'm looking at this panel, um, I am always even conscious of like my male privilege. Right. We need diversity of the voices voices. We need diversity of gender. We need diversity of thought. Yeah, you can applaud. I was raised by strong women, so I have no problem advocating for, 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 for the women. But you know, I think that we need, in effect, a software update um, to this country. Um, when you think about talking about the founding fathers, what they did, I, I do think that they looked down the quarters of time in order to establish uh, the chief cornerstone by which this country is going to you know, stand on. Um, and have a, a firm foundation, but also we need a software update on terms of our values that catch up with our, that are in line with our beliefs and are also in line with what society, where society is moving and not necessarily where we have been. That's not to discount, discount the notion that we do need a historical preservation of where we come from and have a deep respect for what, how we were founded in this country, but we definitely need a software update, so to speak. We've been talking so far at a fairly high level of abstraction. Um, I want to wrap up in the last few minutes by asking, what can ordinary people who don't live in Washington, who don't have meetings with, with senators, who don't have a lot of money to donate to campaigns or educational institutions, do in their own lives after walking out the door to help a little bit? even if they're not going to transform the country or the world? Well, I think that you can transform your community. Every person that you're talking about, they live in a community. Within that community, you have dog catchers, <laughs> you have uh, sheriffs, you have people on the local level who are in, in, impacting your li literally your daily life. And so even if you don't think that you can change things in Washington, if you don't think that you can change things on a state level, you can change things in your community. You can literally start have a righteous indignation that is stirred up so deeply inside, inside of you. And you can just have such a disdain for what is going on in your community that you get involved. How do you get involved? You can just simply say, hey, look, I'm going to go down to my town and or city hall and I'm going to speak out about why my roads are not paved, why well, I'm going to speak out about why my garbage is not collected on a Monday or a Tuesday when it seems like the people who are in, are in affluent communities or in affluent zip codes, they get their garbage collected. That's what you can do. You don't necessarily have to think you don't have to shoot for the stars. You can literally start right where you are. Look, you can be digital advocates, right? Um, you can retweet a petition. Um, for someone who is running for office, you can you can sign a petition on on uh, 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 color of change or one of those other uh, petition based uh, platform. You there are things that you can do in order to get involved. You don't necessarily have to do it on a grand scale. I guess my my answer would. I, I was also going to say this as well. Yeah. Let me just let me just yeah, please sure. share this share this. My advocacy began while I was incarcerated. My organizing began while I was incarcerated. I literally would see that the commissary would increase a honey bun, and the honey bun out here may not be much, <laughs> may not be much to you, but when you're incarcerated, it's very meaningful. <laughs> they would increase the honey bun, uh, the cost of a honey bun from 25 cent to uh, 15 cent, but they not, would not give the, the so-called uh, inmates a cost of living, living adjustment on, on, on inmate uh, wages. Mm -hmm. And so I would be outside of commissary encouraging the entire population to boycott the commissary, right? That's how my advocacy was, was started. Boycott the commissary. You don't, like, you don't like how they're going up on prices? We need to boycott them. We don't need to go to, you don't like the way that the food tastes, the quality of the food here is at the institution? Let's do a two-day uh, uh, so, uh, solidary fast. I call it a solidary fast so they didn't put me in a special housing unit. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that my advocacy begin in the most unlikely, likeliest of places. 
It was in the darkest of places of society where you would think that advocacy would be stirring, where you would think that organizing would have a, 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 an ember that would be lit, that ultimately would light a flame for me to be out here and advocate for more than 30 bills to get more than 500,000 people free out of our criminal justice system. I would answer kind of maybe in the same line, but not on issues. Don't go to prison. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I retired in December 22. Uh, the book came out in November 22. Um, we, Celinda and I, um, we did not go with a major publisher because I wanted, the, I wanted the book to come out right after the 22 election. And I didn't want to go to a publisher that was going to spend a year rewriting it to put their own label on it. Um, we came out, and in three weeks, we made the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list without a major publisher behind us. It wasn't because of having the publicity to push the book. People are hungry for some normalcy and some niceness and some civility and some respect out there. And I think um, I've, I've spent every penny the book has brought in going to civility institutes like this across the country. I've spoken in 38 of the states um, that have civility institutes at their universities. They are popping up all over the country. I think one of the ways all of you can help is support this institution, but also to support a, a respect or civility movement in this country, because I think this country is ready for it. And I think that that alone, getting some leaders that will stand up and light the way and speak out for that, um, uh, we can turn this around along with many of the things we talked about tonight. So it's hard to follow this eloquence. I want to say I think the short answer is join something. Mm. And that Bob Putnam, as many of you know, wrote of his book Bowling Alone, and there have been so there is there's debates about exactly what's happened, but there's a general, there's a broad consensus that uh, we are not the joiners that uh, people were in earlier generations. Um, and that simply creating senses of community in your, uh, uh, where you are, um, a sense of community where you are and different communities where you are can begin to solve this problem. The second thing is that um, I think there are opportunities for people of different views to find ways of coming together. I have wanted, for example, religious institutions. We know we are kind of polarized within our religious institutions for conservative churches and liberal churches and so on and people of different faiths uh, in interfaith dialogues. Um, but they're not just dialogues about what do we agree or disagree on. Um, I think one of the problems in the society as we moved from in campaigns, it's not about a problem to be solved, uh, it's about an issue to use to create a majority. Um, and I think that identifying locally and nationally problems to, the problems that we want to solve is a, a beginning of a way to talk to each other. And I, I want to just underscore what you said about the influence a person on the ground can have on the national conversation. Uh, members of Congress actually notice which way the mail is going uh, or their emails are going in their office. Petitions can make a difference. Um, but I want to I want to close with just one good thing that might actually be happening right now in Washington. Many of you have heard about the child tax credit, and it's designed to help uh, poor um, uh, poor families and particularly kids in poor families. Um, we had it for a year; it did get renewed by Congress. Um, there is a proposal that's not as big as it should be. It's not as big as the original one. Um, but it, um, it, was, they, it was a compromise, so they narrowed it, but it, hit, it gets to the poorest kids in America. They paired it with some tax breaks that business wanted, mostly pretty inoffensive tax breaks like for research and development, and they actually paid for it by getting rid of another business tax break that most people agreed uh, didn't work. Um, it got out of committee 40 to 3 yesterday in the House which is unheard of. It's obviously endorsed by liberals, 
brought a whole series of people, including uh, large parts of the Right to Life movement, uh, where the, uh, large parts of the Right to Life movement are saying, yes, we should help moms with kids. If this little piece passes, it's a, it's a lot of money in those families. It'll mean a lot of money to those kids. That shows we can actually do this. Uh, and uh, John Kennedy had in his inaugural address, um, um, you know, can an, uh, can an oasis, I think it was a kind of mixed metaphor, but I've always loved it, something like, uh, can oasis of, an oasis of, um, of compromise, uh, of, uh, an oasis of cooperation push back the jungles of suspicion? And I view this little, this move in Congress as maybe a, one moment to push back against the jungles of suspicion, and that would be a great thing. <laughs> let, let, let me just add to that, because it's very important. It's, a, it's another group that is out there. I can't give you the name to it, because they haven't made it public yet. But they got involved in the, uh, the um, gay marriage bill, was when they first got involved in it with Tillis and the Colorado yeah. senator. And basically what they, what they were saying is they had several different senators, Republican senators, who voted for it and immediately started getting attacked. My wife is Joan Aaron's chief of staff in Iowa, and they started attacking her for, this is a sign she's always been a liberal and she's not gonna run again. And, and what this group did You're is- You're saying Joan Ernst is a liberal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What they did is they came in to Tillis's in North Carolina, and they created Earn Media explaining the compromise he got in order to vote for it. And the compromise he got was to take away the churches from being a target if they refused right. to do a gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't talked about a lot during the bill, but all the Republicans that voted for it voted for it because they took out that, that exposure to the churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And they're now doing the same thing on this bill, um, that they're, they're picking people that are going to compromise but be demonized by their far right or by their far left um, for voting that way. And I think that's gonna help a great deal in the future. But that's- no, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. I so, just wanna, yeah. when, when um, the beautiful thing about knowledge is you can correct yourself on stage. Yeah. <laughs> and I do not wanna misquote John F. Kennedy's great line. It is, if a beachhead of cooperation may push back the jungle, of suspicion. Yeah. So I'm for beachheads tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm for leaving the jungle of suspicion. So once again, uh, thank you to uh, the, the panel and thanks to you in the audience. It has been a pleasure and I'm told that we will continue the conversation in the lobby. So uh, thank good you evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. That was fun. Pardon? That was fun. That was great. Thanks. Please join me in giving another round of applause to Dr. Goldman and her family. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. I learned a lot from you guys. I learned a lot from you guys. Thank you to all four of you for sharing your expertise, your knowledge, your um, life's experience, and for certainly giving us a lot to think about. And I think most of you would agree with me when we say that this is a conversation that we should be continuing as we leave and go through this next election year. If you enjoyed tonight's conversation and are looking for more opportunities to participate in civil discourse, please join us next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. in the store ballroom of the Student Center across campus. And we will be having a small group discussion and panel discussion on the power of labels to unify or divide. More information about that can be found on the back of your program. And finally, if you value creating a space like this for community dialogue, please consider supporting the Stubblefield Institute, and you can find out information about how to do that on our website. And thank you again for joining us this evening, and I invite you to join us for a reception and to meet our panelists and our moderator in the lobby. Can I mention, can I <laughs> Um, and I do have one more announcement. We do have copy, uh, copies of Ed's book available in the lobby, and the pro um, Ed graciously donated those, and the proceeds do support the Stubblefield Institute as well. So thank you.
I, I, I said, you know, um, one of the things since I was on, like, 